just throw my time there. I'm going to be talking about some work that I've been doing. It goes back a few years now, but it's trying to get at the role of emotion in, in language access and in a kind of roundabout way using core currents models that I'll explain in a few minutes. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how it came to that work and then I'll give you some examples of uh, what we've been doing with it. So uh, here's the obligatory quote from James, William James that you always have to start with. William James in Principles of Psychology has this sentence, which I like very much. It says, we ought to say a feeling of and, a feeling of if, a feeling of but, and a feeling of by, meaning the words, of course. Quite as readily as we say a feeling of blue or a feeling of cold. So he's getting at this idea that words have not only meanings, which we know they do, but those meanings also give us some kind of feelings. They, they, they make us feel in, in a certain way, um, even when the words are seemingly having the same meanings. Of course, poets and novelists know this very well. When poets and novelists write, they, they're very careful to choose the word that has the right kind of effect, even if they're substituting a word that seems like it's a, a synonym for the word they're choosing. I, I think this is a particularly interesting sentence just because he chose all closed class words as his examples of all the words that you think would have not a feeling. I think it's interesting that he went for the words that have the, the kind of most smeared semantics, the, the, the lightest semantics in some ways, and uh, and yet he, he used them as his examples. So here's another line about how I'm going to talk a little bit about how I came to do this sort of thing, because it was something I sort of stumbled into. <coughs> I'll talk a little bit about some neurological underpinnings. Uh, I have an introduction to co-occurrence models that I, I grayed out because I thought if everyone here was from Harold Byron's lab, I would go through it very quickly because I thought you might all know it. But since there's some people here who they don't know the model, uh, I'll go through it in a little bit of detail. Talk about some uh, experimental results from uh, looking at image ability, whether a word is concrete or not, and then talk about two other areas I've looked at, emotion and subjective familiarity, and finally, uh, emotionality judging some x five says so something I've just started with. So I've been studying abstract and concrete words for a long, long time. For so long that I'm actually quite sick of studying them, and many years ago I said, that I was sick and I wasn't going to do anymore, but uh, then something happened that I would explain to you that made me change my mind. So the distinction here between abstract and concrete words is whether or not the word has a reference in the real world. If you can point to the thing or touch it or smell it or feel it, it's a concrete thing. Um, if you can't, then it's an abstract thing. It's a, it's a distinction that's been studied for a long time in psycholinguistics for a lot of good reasons. Um, in particular because it seems to be a kind of natural split in semantics. A lot of people, in fact, use it as a kind of paradigmatic semantic distinction. And I think in part because it's interesting because it seems to also present a biological break between uh, humans and non-humans. So it seems there's something special about the fact that we can uh, access and use um, abstract words. So people have studied them have found a lot of differences. For example, concrete words are acquired earlier than abstract words. <clears throat> They're recognized more quickly than abstract words. They're remembered better than abstract words, and they're less sensitive than brain to brain damage, to most of the brain damage than abstract words. There are some cases that go the other way, but most often people after brain damage are better with concrete words than abstract words. A few years ago I did an imaging study with uh, Jeff Binder that looked at abstract and concrete words. Had people put in the uh, fMRI scanner while they were doing visualized scope decision when they saw strings on the screen and they just had to decide if the word they were seeing was a uh, word, real word in English or not and we manipulated the, uh, the words so that half of them are abstract and half of them are concrete. This is a nice task to do in the scanner because there's no difference in response now between our abstract and concrete words. They're doing exactly the same thing, hitting the same button for abstract and concrete words and yet we can look for uh, differences between those words while controlling for their response in that way. What we found is uh, Shown on the next slide, the left inferior frontal lobe activation that was most strongly uh, implicating for abstract word access. So here's a picture. The top slide shows abstract uh, words minus non-words in the scanner. So in this case, the orange and yellow is where there was, there was more activation for abstract words than for non-words. Uh, one of the things you can see is abstract words and non-words are treated quite similarly. There's not a lot of activity, but you get some activity down here, which is the one I'm going to focus on. <laughs> this is uh, concrete words minus abstract words. So here the blue is more activation for abstract words than concrete words. And you can see that we get some activation in that same area. Here they are put on top of each other so you can see this activation in the inferior frontal lobe garments area 10 and 11, which um, is one of the key 
You can see that there's other areas going out here, but this is one of the key areas that seems to most strongly differentiate abstract words and uh, concrete words. Other people have had done this study before us, and they've done it since then, and they find similar things. The, the general finding is that abstract words are always associated with increased uh, activation in the prefrontal cortex. Well, we were, we were actually a little bit puzzled by that when we first saw it, because it's not really a primary language area that low down in the frontal lobes, but it has been associated with phonological processing in a bunch of studies, and phonological processing in quite a general way. So it's been implicated in uh, both reading studies and non-reading lexical um, phonological processes like lexical retrieval, recall, auditory phonological decision where they make decisions about words they are hearing, and uh, auditory rhyme judgment, which is not as important as it might seem from the way I've uh, italicized it. That's from a different talk. So, so after we reviewed this, we argued in our paper, okay, well maybe the uh, reason we're seeing that activation is because abstract words need more phonological processing, and the reason they might need more phonological processing is because they have um, diminished semantics. They get less less strong semantics than uh, concrete words, and that was the argument we pushed in our paper. I was never totally satisfied with the argument because it was sort of it was ad hoc and uh, post hoc too. We just kind of made it up once we saw the activation, but it seemed to fit the. Uh, the picture. And we did go on and do some experiments to test it. So after that, my grad student and I, and my former uh, postdoc supervisor, Niall Ward Buchanan, um, did a whole bunch of experiments to try to look at whether or not abstract words were really more sensitive to phonology than concrete words. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all because I would run out of time if I did. But the take home message was yeah, we got a lot of evidence showing that abstract words were more sensitive to manipulations of phonology than concrete words, especially when there was no orthographic orthographics involved. So we often found that, that the, uh, the results were either stronger or only existent when we presented the words auditorily. So at the time I was quite satisfied. I thought, okay, we made up, we kind of made that up, but then we um, went and found some evidence that it was true, so maybe it really is true. Now I'm starting to doubt it, and you'll understand why as I go through the talk today. I'm wondering if those, if those results actually might have not so much to do with abstract words per se, but with emotionality, and it's actually an emotionality effect that we've been studying all this time. <clears throat> One reason you might think that is because uh, there has been a very strong association with this area, Romans area 10 and 11, with emotionality. So people have studied the, the neural cor correlates of emotionality and self-directed um, processing have strongly implicated that area in emotional processing. And in this uh, review that was done a few years ago, where they tried to break down the uh, neural correlates of self-referential processing, they, they identified three main places that were implicated. One is not uh, so much interest, it's high up in Brogman's area 9, or a lot of prefrontal cortex that they said was uh, associated on self-reflection upon one's own state of mind. Uh, as you may know, it's implicated in just about everything. It lights up in many, many tasks that involve kind of complex cognition. So. The second area uh, that is in Brogman's area 10 that they identified plays a, plays a role in uh, mental scene construction. And the third area, uh, I think the most interesting area for my purposes today, was associated with uh, task variables, and I'm going to quote here, that were related to personal significance, introspection about one's own mental state, and evoked emotion, and with evaluating aspects of personal um, significance. And in the paper, um, Andrews Han and all consider this to be the, the, the core system for self-related processing and for uh, um, emotional processing above one's uh, current state. This is consistent with other evidence. This is just showing the, the main seat from resting state connectivity studies where you put people in scanners and tell them to do nothing and then you, you look for correlated activity. When you do that, you get a whole bunch of regions which seem to be uh, implicated together and one of them is this region here which was associated in a recent study that looked at this with a mental scene construction and evaluation, which makes sense if you're sitting in the scanner and asked to do nothing, what are you going to do? You're going to daydream and think about things, and they find that uh, that's the area that lights up when they're doing that. And other people who have looked more directly at Brahman's area 10 have looked, uh, said that it's implicated in effective and emotional states, positive to underlie more intuitive forms of self reference. The other interesting thing about this area, once you start looking at it, Brahman's area 10, is that it's also uh, an area that seems to strongly differentiate humans from non-human primates. It's proportionally much larger in the human brain than it is in 
other uh, primary brains, and many people <coughs> said that it's uh, the only area of prefrontal cortex that's much larger in human beings than in other animals. Other people have said exactly the same thing about other areas in the prefrontal cortex, so you have to take it with a bit of a grain of salt, but there was some ev evidence, there's certainly evidence suggesting that it's um, very different in human beings, much larger in human beings than it is in other uh, primates. And here's just the data showing that. So this is the uh, relative and absolute size of area 10 in both uh, volume <laughs> and percent of brain volume with the little black dots in humans compared to um, bonobos, our closest cousins, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and gibbons. You can see that the area gets to be smaller both in absolute terms and in proportion of total brain area as you move down the phylogenetic scale because that's only what we would think of doing as we went along this scale. So as, as animals become less intelligent or less human-like, they have a smaller and smaller um, problem area tends both in absolute terms and in relative terms. <coughs> yes? Can I? V8 and 11 is the same as the orbital frontal cortex. It is. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 yeah, 11 rounds right, right under the orbital. So this is of interest once you start thinking about this, if you're interested in the abstract word activation that I showed you at the beginning, because there is a strong relationship between abstract words and emotionality. And so I, I stumbled onto a way to start looking at this that uh, I hadn't thought of when we first did that study, and here's how it came about. I used a model called co-occurrence model of semantics that Cyrus had worked with me on. And the basic idea of this model, for those who don't know it, is it tries to compute uh, model lexical semantics by computing similarity between vectors that represent the context of words, uh, the, uh, the context in which words occurred in a very large corpus of text. So we're up to using a 20 billion word corpus now. And uh, within that corpus, we can count how often words occur beside each other and then compare those counts to each other and um, get some um, semantic like features coming out. I, I'm very fond of these models. I've been a bit obsessed with them ever since I heard about them. Because when I first read of them, I thought, wow, at last someone has come up with a way to quantify semantic access. And that's pretty cool. That's pretty fantastic. They have many nice features. They're very easy to understand. They're not that complicated. They do reduce uh, some aspects of the semantics, not all aspects of the semantics, to some grounded empirical data, namely the, the language that appears in this corpus. And um, they're compatible with information processing models in the formal sense of the word. The, the kind of models that uh, people here work on all the time. And they do have a pretty good record of predicting uh, human data. Here's just a brief cartoon of how they work. So here's the idea. If you have a word like run, we might uh, keep track of how often it occurs with every word in the human language, uh, in the, in the uh, English language, sorry, the human language. <laughs> um, <laughs> in English is the real human language. <laughs> Um, and so in this case, the, the word is run, and the example word is bank, and you can see that there's, there's a bunch of cells there, and they have numbers in them, and those cells represent how often the word uh, run co-occurred with the word, word bank within a, a distance of one word in front, two words in front, three words, four words, five words, and one word behind, two words behind, three words, and four words, and so on. Once you've done that, you can weight the words, we usually use some kind of weighting system to decide how strongly to rate the words, and you end up with a a weight that gives you a backwards measure and a forwards measure, you put that into a, a global co-occurrence vector, so now you have a vector that has all the words in the alphabet across the top, and, uh, all the words in the uh, dictionary, sorry, across the top, and all the words uh, in your dictionary, more or less, down the side. It's actually a small subset of those for technical reasons. And then you can uh, eventually put those into the global co-occurrence ma matrix, which has all of the other words, and you can compare these vectors um, by seeing how similar they are, and that comparison gives you a, a, a quantitative measure of how similar those words are based on how similar the context that they appeared in was. There's a couple of things you can get out of this. One thing you can get is just how similar the words are by comparing their vectors directly. You can get a direct co-occurrence uh, measure of similarity. We also compute two measures that I'm going to be talking about today um, that characterize the co-occurrence neighborhood of a word in terms of its density. So one of them is called the average radius of co-occurrence, which is the average distance of all the neighbors that fall within a standardized range. I'll show you a cartoon in the next slide. And uh, the number of neighbors that fall within that range, which we call n count. I'm going to be using the inverse of that for technical reasons that I won't bore you with, but uh, 
It's just the same measure but flipped over. So here's a, just an example to get you thinking about how it would work. Here's our target word run. Here's our threshold that we uh, compute dynamically when we build the model to try and find a, a good threshold that um, is a function of the average distance between randomly chosen words. And then we count the number of words that fall within that, and we can get that. That would be the end count, and we get the average distance of those words, and that would be the uh, arc, the average radius of co-occurrence. <coughs> so there's a um, theory called context availability theory that says that one of the reasons that abstract words have all the properties that they have, that they're harder to access, and so on is that they're more sensitive, more dependent upon context than, 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 uh, than concrete words are. And there's a bunch of evidence that shows that one of the pieces of evidence is that a lot of concrete uh, word effects disappear when you put the words in sentences. So when you give them more context, you don't see them. The, words are, the, the effects are most strongly seen when you show the words one by one without any context. <clears throat> so this is an uh, interesting theory for us because the problem with this theory is always the word context, which is a very slippery word. And if you look at context availability theory experiments, they, all, they often take the word to mean different things and they kind of make it up as they go along. Well, the nice thing about the uh, co-occurrence model is it gives you a quantitative way for thinking about what context is in just the way that I, I just said. We should expect that if, if this theory is true, if context availability theory is right, then we should see that abstract words have smaller or tighter co-occurrence neighborhoods than concrete uh, words do when we use uh, our model to measure that. So here's an example, just to again give you a feel for the model of some neighborhoods that have come out of the model. These are the top 20 neighbors for uh, three randomly chosen words. And if you see, if you look at them, you can see two, two things. One is that uh, they do tend to be related. If you look at the top 20 na na neighbors, you go, yeah, they're related. And you can also see they mix um, semantic information with associative information. So some of the words are literally part of the definition or literally another word that means the same thing as the uh, Keywords, so snowstorm is almost a uh, synonym for blizzard. And some of the words are just words that are associated. So weather is not a synonym for blizzard, but it is obviously associated with blizzard. And um, that's the kind of neighborhoods that, we, that I'm going to be talking about. So when I, when I started doing off the study looking at co occurrence, I started out with just about 4,000 uh, words that I had immobility ratings from. These are human immobility ratings where you show the word to people and say on a scale of one to seven, is this word abstract or concrete? For a long time, that was the only way people had for uh, deciding if a word was abstract or concrete. You had to ask people. What I did is I, I, I computed the uh, phonological neighborhood of these words, how many words were similar to, to it, or one by one phoning difference, got their frequency, and then I I calculated these two measures that I just told you about, the end count and the arc for them. And uh, I'm going to talk about these data in terms of centiles, where I, I squish them into 100 bins of 38 words each. just makes it easier to see the pattern. It does, uh, as people sometimes point out, one of my students complains when I do this, because it does kind of make the correlations uh, meaningless. But <coughs> I will show you all the correlations that I'm going to talk about, just as reliably for an individual word uh, as they do for centiles. And here's what we found when we first did this in very brief form. We found that just as uh, context availability theory would predict, non individual words have uh, fewer neighbors. So the lower they are on um, imageability, sorry, the lower they are on imageability on the y axis here, the uh, smaller their arcs, that the, uh, that's the uh, average distance of those neighbors, and the larger their inverse end counts, which means they have a smaller number of neighbors. So the take home message is abstract words have a smaller number of neighbors and they're more tightly clustered around them than concrete words. <coughs> you can see it's a pretty strong uh, effect with these uh, 100, 100 bins. You can account for 81% uh, of the variance, which is pretty good for just one measure. Uh, this is 81% of the variance in those, those uh, judgments, from human judgments of immutability. So I was pretty happy when that data came out, and I thought, oh, I'll present it. And I went to a big conference called Psychonomics and presented it, and a lot of people came up to me and said, you know, it's sort of interesting, but you should do something about emotionality, because there's also uh, evidence suggesting that abstract words tend to have higher emotionality than concrete words. 
and this was the beginning of my forays into emotionality. At the time, I wasn't so enthused about doing that because the only way to measure emotionality reward was to get human judgments. And I thought, we're really getting ourselves into trouble if we're going to start trying to explain human judgments with other human judgments, because we really don't know what, what, what people are doing when we ask them to give us those kind of measures. So after a while, I thought, well, maybe I can use co-occurrence models to get some kind of objective measure of uh, emotionality. So I started off kind of randomly by finding a model. At the time, I knew nothing about emotion. I just went out and looked for a model that seemed uh, plausible to me. And the one that I picked by Plutchik from 1980 was plausible to me because it had a kind of cross-species bias. It was trying to argue that these are the basic emotions that are seen across all species. And I thought, good enough for me. I'll, I'll start with these. So these were the eight emotions in his model. Joy, trust, fear, surprise, sadness, disgust, anger, and anticipation. Since then, I found out there's a lot of emotional models out there, and they differ very much in uh, which words they think are the basic emotions. But almost all of them include fear, disgust, anger, and sadness. So um, there's debate about what else should be in there. Uh, I'll talk about that at the very end of my talk. But I think that, that as, a good, as a first uh, pass, it wasn't a bad model to choose. So then I calculated the distance between these uh, eight words and all the good words that I had imageability ratings for. And I looked to see if just that distance would predict the imageability ratings. Uh, there was a positive correlation. But they were all intercorrelated with each other. So it was the first step to get around that. I just averaged all the distances together and added that to the regression model. <clears throat> when you do that, you do get an improvement in the uh, regression model. So it goes from taking up 81% of the variance to taking up 82% of the variance, which is pretty good for 1,024 uh, data points. And you can see that it is, there's a, a correlation, uh, r squared, of uh, 0.18 just between the emotional distance, the average emotional distance, and those human imageability judgments. So it seems to suggest that you can maybe use these um, models to get at emotion judgments, but it's not <coughs> a very strong effect. <coughs> One of the problems with that is uh, you don't really know if those are the right emotion words to choose. Not only do you not know if you chose the right model to begin with, maybe Plechik's model wasn't right to take the words from, but you don't really know if they should be combined in some more intelligent way than by just averaging them together. Maybe there's some way to weight them that would make more sense, but it's a problem because you don't want to search forever and it becomes tricky if you spend too much time searching because you just look like you're overfitting your data. But I, I couldn't help thinking, what, what happens if those basic terms could be combined in some more useful way than just uh, averaging them all together. <coughs> so I used a piece of software we have in our lab that was uh, built by a former student of mine called the uh, University of Alberta Nonlinear Correlation Explorer, which is a program that uses artificial evolution to evolve nonlinear equations. It just takes in a bunch of predictors and something to be predicted, and it evolves equations using natural selection that tries to fit them as close well as possible. It has some built-in <coughs> methods for avoiding overfitting the data. It doesn't fit all of the data at once, and then it, uh, it automatically tries to uh, generalize it to other parts of the data than where it was developed on. So I stuck it in, gave it the eight emotion words, and asked it to find an equation to maximize the prediction uh, of imageability. It was very fast. It often is very fast, but in this case, the uh, best one came out in uh, about 30 seconds. And it was uh, very simple. This suggested that I should just take the distance from the word joy divided by the distance from the word disgust, which I call the joy-disgust ratio. And when you start thinking about that, it is a sort of an interesting measure because joy and disgust are more or less opposite from each other. And if you take that ratio, what you're really doing is putting uh, words on a, unit, a single dimension which runs from basically visceral goodness, joy, to visceral badness, felt badness, disgust. Um, if you look at how well that model does in predicting uh, words, so here's a qualitative example. These are the, the words that are lowest on that ratio, which means the most strongly associated with the disgust, the furthest towards the disgust end of the joy disgust uh, dimension. And if you look at the word stanch, uh, which only, stanch is a word that only can be used for stopping blood from flowing, so it's a, a word that's uh, got strong connotations of bodily unpleasantness. Unease, foible, fame, rile, peak, jeer, tried, loathe, deposed, stooge, slur. You can see that all these are quite negative words. So it seems from that evidence to be doing a reasonable job, at least, of picking out words that are 
uh, more negative than from words that are more positive. Here's the other end of the spectrum. These are the words that came up highest on the ratio. The first one is the word half, which is a biblical word. It pretty much only occurs in the Bible. And uh, then there's a bunch of other biblical words. But there's also a bunch of words that are not biblical, but uh, positively uh, associated. So feast, uh, wine, rain, garden, gift, and so on. I actually think these biblical words are of particular interest because if you look at the um, imageability ratings that these words were given by human beings, don't forget these human beings were asked to judge, is this an abstract word or a concrete word on a scale from 1 to 7? And you can see that they quote words like heaven and glory, which clearly are non-imageable in the strictest sense of the word. We can't actually see heaven, we can't actually see glory, we can't see spirit or grace. Uh, nevertheless, human beings tended to mark those higher than average, towards the high end, actually, towards the concrete side. side. So, um, you would say, if you were being strict in marking this, although you, know, you can't really override what the people say, but I think if you were being strict, you would have to say these are mistakes. Soul, angel, spirit, grace, uh, glory in heaven shouldn't be high concrete words, and yet they are rated as high concrete words. So it suggests to me that already people are doing something instead of using imageability, and they might be using the, uh, this, this kind of measure, some sort of emotionality measure, to say, uh, glory is... Glory and heaven are imageable because I feel something when I think of heaven and glory. They do something for me, so I have a tangible um, response to them, and that tangible response makes them think, I've got to mark this high, because this is a word that really somehow affects me. Just to, This is just to show you that it wasn't really just a way of getting at religious words. There is a lot of religious words there in the first you know, 20 or whatever it was on that slide, but the ones after that show a lot of other things that are good that aren't necessarily religiously related, it's like gold, onion, lemon, so on, fruit, air. The joint discuss ratio by itself is an unbelievably good predictor of imageability judgments. With, with, uh, with ARC and uh, N count, the correlation goes up to 0.87, which is a very substantial and very uh, strong uh, leap forward, and you can see now we're counting for 77% of the variance and getting quite a tight fit around our, our uh, estimates coming out of the regression model and those human imageability judgments that we started out with. Here's the part where I show you that I'm not lying by uh, binning them. Here they are unbinned, and you can see although of course the correlation is much smaller, it's extremely reliable and uh, I'll test for less uh, variance. Here's the word half again to the big outlier. What we later found when we looked into this a little bit more was a very strange interaction. The interaction was between imageability category as uh, judged by human judgment, so whether or not humans decided the word was high or low imageability. Uh, this joy disgust ratio and this average radius of co-occurrence. So three-way interactions are hard to understand. I'm going to walk you a little bit slowly through this one because it is kind of important to understand the whole thing. So here's the first case. When you have words that are high, on an average radius of co-occurrence, which is what we associated with concrete words, and high on joy disgust, which is what we associated with concrete words, people respond to them very quickly in lexical decision, whether that word is an abstract word or a concrete word. So although these words are, by our measure, coming out as a, uh, generally being associated with concrete, that's, even when it's an abstract word, people respond to it quickly. You see the inverse for the uh, words that are in the opposite end of the spectrum, so these are words that have low average radius of co-occurrence and low joy disgust, which are the words that we associate with for understanding abstract and concrete words. And the reason is, when you look at the distribution of um, these characteristics, high or low on joy disgust and arc among concrete versus abstract words, they're hugely skewed. So this is now the percent of words in each imageability category, high, medium, or low, as, as decided by human judgments, that fall either into the um, high joy disgust, high arc uh, category, or the low joy disgust, low arc category. And the important thing to notice is, if you look at the concrete words, almost all of the words, 55 to 14 percent, are um, in this high high category. Um, and if you look at the abstract words, the opposite is true. Almost all of the words are in the low low category, and uh, very, very very many fewer in the high high category. So there, the ratio is 48 
to 22. In other words, <coughs> this means if you say, I'm going to do an imageability experiment and I'm going to take um, human judgments of imageability, I'm going to pick out the words that are uh, either high or low on imageability and make my experiment out of it, there's a very high chance that you're going to be choosing high joy disgust, high arc words when you choose concrete words, and there's a very high chance that you're going to be choosing low joy disgust words, uh, low arc words when you choose abstract words. And this is a problem because if you do that, you're going to be choosing fast words here and slow words here. In other words, you're going to be oversampling the slow words from the abstract words and oversampling the fast words from the concrete words. And uh, you're going to have a sampling bias. And it turns out that a lot of the imageability effect can be explained by this sampling bias. Here's a, a very compelling example, I think. If you set the, uh, the reaction times for all of the categories in that um, uh, average radius of co-occurrence by joy discussed um, groups, so you, you take high, high, High low, a high low by high low in each of those uh, two categories, and you just say, I'm just going to fix the reaction time at, at the average for those kind of words. In other words, I'm going to say all words that are high high are responded to in this amount of time, and all words that are low low are responded to in this amount of time. So now there's no imageability entering into the thing at all. You're just saying I'm just going to fix those four categories and then sample them according to the proportion in which they're um, biased into the, in those categories. Uh, as shown on the slide previously. In other words, I'm going to sample them at this ratio. I'm going to pick my concrete words. Uh, previous slide here. I'm going to pick my concrete words 55 to 14, and I'm going to pick my abstract words 48 to 22 in the other way, exactly following the ratio that uh, we found among all the words. This is what happens when you do that. You get low imageability words coming out much slower because now you're oversampling those slow words. You get mid imageability words coming out medium because there's a medium um, sampling bias in the medium words, and you get high imageability words coming out very fast because you're oversampling those high, high words. So you get a really nice looking imageability effect, but this is due 100% to the, the uh, sampling bias. There's nothing in these words that says anything about imageability. It's just uh, based on the uh, observable sampling bias. So, hopefully, you see why that's a problem because now, you're getting the imageability effect, having taken the imageability completely out of the equation. Here's another picture that shows the same thing in a slightly different way. This just is the best fit between uh, um, the joint discuss ratio and arc for predicting concreteness. And you can see what happens is words that have only close neighbors are always going to be predicted uh, low. This is the model estimates that they'll, they'll get low predictions. And then it starts spreading out once you get above a certain uh, distance from the words, and you start getting uh, effects of both joy discuss and average radius of co-occurrence. <coughs> this is the thing that came out of the experiment that we were originally planning to look at. Originally, our idea was we were going to manipulate how sensitive people were to disgustability and see if it had an effect on their uh, their um, concreteness uh, uh, effect. So what, whether they would show stronger uh, slower responses to abstract words if they were more susceptible to disgust. So to do that, we used the scale called the disgust propensity and sensitivity scale. We picked out people who were highly sensitive to disgust and not at all sensitive to disgust. Unfortunately, nothing came out of that. We couldn't find an effect of the kind that we predicted, but we did find a main effect of disgustability, which is sort of interesting. This shows that people who are highly prone to disgustability are slower at making lexical decisions than people who are not highly prone to uh, disgustability. So here's the self-rated disgustability scale on a scale of 1 to 7, and here's the reaction times that are fitted to it. And you can see that there's quite a strong effect there. I took this out and replicated it in real life. Uh, recently I had people reading uh, some fables. In fact, I used Grimm's fairy tales. I didn't know I was going to be coming to Germany to talk about it at the time. I used Grimm's fairy tales because they're nice and short, they have a kind of similarity of style, and there's a lot of them. So I uh, analyzed uh, all of the, the fables that I could find, 51 of them, and uh, calculated the joy disgust ratio for every word in them. And I found two that had, have, on average, high joy disgust uh, words, and two that on average, uh, low joy disgust words. You couldn't tell, I don't think, from reading these. It wasn't that one felt very abstract, but it was the way that the, uh, the numbers came out when I ran the uh, model. Then all I had is I had each participant read a story in counterbalanced order. Uh, with multiple choice comprehension questions at the end, just to make sure they'd actually read it. 
So the way they read it was uh, sentence by sentence, and they just pushed the space bar when they wanted to move on to the next sentence. I analyzed it, uh, analyzed it with linear mixed effects modeling by sentence, um, looking at reaction time per character to get rid of length. And I had a random effects of sentence order and subject and fixed effects of frequency, emotionality, and joint disgust. And here's what I got. I replicated the effect that I've seen with uh, lexical decision. This, these uh, reaction times are much faster because this is real radiance. So people skip over a lot of words. They don't have to spend so much time thinking of what to do with each word. But you can see that people who were high on emotionality were slower readers than uh, people who were low on emotionality. And there was also a big um, joy discuss effect in exactly the same uh, uh, direction that we've just been talking about. So words that were high in joy discussed were read more quickly than words that were uh, low in joy discussed. So that's the, how I got interested in emotionality. Now I'm going to tell you quickly a couple of other things I've done with emotionality since then. If any of you have worked in psycholinguistics, especially with single words, you've probably had papers rejected because you didn't control for subjective familiarity. People uh, do reviews often like to find a reason to reject a paper, and one very good reason that you can always use is if the person didn't control for something that you particularly like. And one of the things that people particularly like is this, this uh, construct called subjective familiarity, which is basically reflecting the fact that human judgments of how familiar a word is dissociate a little bit from how frequent that word actually is. So if you ask people to judge uh, how common a word is, or how familiar the word seems to you, you get an effect that is slightly off from how uh, familiar the word should be to them based on its actual objective frequency. This has been a big thing for quite a long time because in 1984, Morten Ann her published a paper where she put a lot of weight on subjective familiarity as an explanatory construct and said if you took into account subjective familiarity, a lot of puzzles in the literature could be explained. So she made a big deal out of it. Uh, here's just to show you that there really is an effect. So if, after you've partialed out frequency, there's still a strong relationship between uh, subjective frequency judgments and uh, No, sorry, after you've partial out reaction to the frequency from reaction times, there's still a strong relationship between reaction times and subjective familiarity rate. So there is something uh, to this. this. This shows you the nature of the effect that there is, um, it does predict lexical access to some extent. People are faster at recognizing words that they judge to be high in subjective familiarity. <coughs> I was mad when I got this review because I've had 100 reviews like it before where people said, we didn't control for subjective familiarity. And I'm like, I didn't, but it is a subjective measure. We don't really know what it's measuring, so I'm not so inclined to control for it. So I really did this work mostly out of uh, anger. <laughs> Which actually is a good motivator for me. So I, when I, just, I pulled, I said, okay, let me, let me figure out what's going on with this thing. So I pulled the norms, and I, I literally had absolutely no idea what I was going to do with them. I just said, let me look at the subjective familiarity norms and see if I can figure out what subjective familiarity really is. When I looked at it, the first thing I noticed is that if you uh, order them by familiarity, order the words by familiarity, so here the scale was 1 to 7, they put it on 1 to 700 scale, um, at least half, and I think you could argue more than half, of the 50 most subjectively familiar words fell into a few small categories, and those categories are clothes, food, money, sex and relationships, and time. When you think about it, that's sort of a strange set of categories to be the most familiar words. And it occurred to me when looking at that, that um, maybe subjective familiarity had something to do with what was important to people. You see, there are students, and the things that are important to students, as many of you know, are clothes, food, beer, money, and relationships. <laughs> so this was my, my initial hypothesis. And what we were looking at when you looked at subjective familiarity was the fact that students like beer, the actual drink. And the reason that they were rating it highly familiar is because it was important to them and they were spending a lot of time around beer, not because they were encountering the word beer more often than anyone else, and that's perhaps in talking about it. So this was the hypothesis I wanted to check. When they ask people to rate how familiar beer the word is, they might instead be rating how familiar or emotionally important beer the beverage is. So to get at that, I, this was just after I'd done the work I just told you about, I thought, well, maybe if this is true, I can get up by some kind of emotionality measure and uh, therefore desubjectify subjective familiarity. So I, I did the same kind of thing. I started with a different model for really no good reason. 
uh, except that I happened to be teaching about Bunt at the time. And I read his model and I said, that's a good model too. And it has, it has dimensions that are opposite to each other and I happened at the time to think that was a good idea for a model. So I, I uh, went with this model which has six words in it. Relax and, or relaxation, tension, excitement, depression, and pleasant, unpleasant. Um, one of the reasons I went for this is it turns out it was replicated many years later by Oswald. So you see in Tannenbaum using a completely different method, they came up with almost exactly the same um, three, di three dimensions, and I thought that was kind of interesting. It turns out it doesn't really make that much difference. I don't think I'll have time to talk about that, but now I know that you can choose pretty much any emotion model and get uh, similar results. So the way I did it is I did uh, linear mixed effects model analysis, trying to use the distance from these emotional word categories, these six emotional word categories, to try and predict the familiarity judgments after partially known objective frequency. So this is the pure familiarity judgment without any component of no frequency in it. Uh, here's my three models. Here's the best one. It has an interaction between relaxation and tension. It has an interaction between joy and despair. And it has excitement, but not the, uh, the opposite of excitement, which uh, dropped out. Uh, the opposite was depression. And it probably dropped out because it's strongly associated with despair, I would think. The uh, predictions that came from this model correlated with 0.69 with the the norm judgments, that's very good for 1,526 judgments. <clears throat> the other uh, um, thing that's interesting is that using human familiarity judgments to predict human familiarity judgments correlates to 0.7, not much higher. So, in other words, only uh, human familiarity judgments from one group of people account for about half the variation in human familiarity judgments from another group of people. So that, that, uh, that initial correlation of uh, 0.69 looks about as well as you can do. What I then tried to do is predict uh, another group's familiarity judgments. I used the same regression equation and just tried it on the other ones. Correlation was 0.66. That turns out not to be significantly different than the, the, uh, the correlation of human judgments to predict those same ones. By Fisher's R to Z comparison, there's no difference. So, in other words, my regression model's estimates of subjective familiarity were right from the beginning with such a simple model, statistically indistinguishable from real people's uh, familiarity judgments. That's a nice finding, but it is only correlational. You can say, okay, well, all you did is fit the data and you managed to find a fit. I thought if it was really true that emotional kick is underlying these subjective from air judgments, the, the best way to show it would be to show that people who are more sensitive to emotional kicks were more likely to, or were going to, um, judge words as being more familiar. So emotionally sensitive people should rate words as more subjectively familiar than emotionally unsensitive people. So again, I picked out people who were emotionally sensitive using this scale behavioral inhibition and reward response the subscale of the behavioral activation scale. They're just scales that are very behavioral, as you might guess from their names, but just say how strongly you react to the things that happen in your life. I picked up people who were high and low on emotionality, and then I had them do a bunch of tasks. The first task was I had them rate 80 words in subjective familiarity. Half of them came from words that had already been rated from the uh, norms. Half of them were words that I had predicted would be either high and low on um, subjective familiarity using my model. And then I analyzed the results using the linear mixed effects models. <coughs> the predicted ratings were just as good, the predicted ratings from the original regression model were just as good at predicting the uh, familiarity ratings for the ones that had already been rated as other uh, norms were. So the, the correlation of my prediction was 0.62, and the correlation with the other norms was 0.72, those were not um, different by Fisher's R to test. Here's the main result, though. People who were highly effective, were, were, um, highly effectively respond, responsive tended towards judge, judge words sorry, as being more subjectively familiar, both when I predicted them to be high and when I predicted them to be um, low than people who had low effective response. That was the main hypothesis, that people who were more sensitive would show a stronger familiarity rate. And to me, that's very strong evidence that what people are doing is some kind of emotional calculation when they decide whether the word is um, familiar to them or not. <clears throat> when, another way you could get at this is by looking at gender differences, because both by uh, subjective experience and by science, it's been shown that females do tend to show a stronger 
emotional responses than males, so you would predict from that that females would tend to rate words as uh, more familiar than males. So I just broke down my data to see if that was true, and sure enough it was true. Uh, ladies rated words as reliably more familiar than uh, males did. Okay, I just have a few minutes left, and I'm um, on my last topic. We're going to talk about something I've just been doing the last few months now, which is uh, using emotionality judgments to look at uh, lexical access. So there, I got into this because just after I finished that last paper, I read this paper by uh, Benny Briesmaster in, in uh, Berlin. And in, in that paper, they tried to predict lexical decision reaction times using human emotion ratings, ratings that have been given by humans to five words. Disgust, fear, anger, sadness, and happiness. And what they showed is that if you took into account how those ratings and put them into a regression equation, they were a reliable predictor of how fast people were making lexical decisions. So I said to I sent my note. <coughs> said, we, should, we should do this again, but we should use co-occurrence models instead of uh, using human judgments. Because by then I was on this rampage to get rid of all judgments in uh, psychology. So we did it. We used predictors. We, for our predictors, we used the distance for uh, all five of those emotion words from um, each of the 1,014 words that he had looked at, because those are the words that he had human ratings for. And, and we regressed out the effects of frequency, number of letters and syllables, orthographic name word, and the distances of the other four emotion words, because they were, they were highly collinear with each other. So we got a very pure measure uh, for each emotion's contribution. Uh, by statistically getting rid of everything that might contaminate it. Uh, here's what we found. When we put those in, all, all of those residual distances measures from emotion words were predictive of lexical access times. The R squared was 0.56, and that was better than the, the human equivalent. It was better than the humans had done. So the, um, the uh, distances that actually were actually a little bit better at predicting uh, lexical decision reaction times than the human judgment, which was probably isn't that surprising because the human judgment slowed down to very noisy. The difference wasn't huge, so for the human judgments, uh, the, the um, R squared is 0.54, that is a big difference by AIC measures. So it's a statistically reliable difference. The nice thing about doing this kind of work, where you say I'm going to take a human judgment and find a way to automate it, is then you can do it for all words. The problem with getting judgments is very tedious, and so that's why we always have a few thousand words that are rated. But once you have the uh, regression equation, and, you, and that <coughs> is coming from measures that you uh, can compute for any word, then you can say, I can now predict some, some emotionality measures for every word in the dictionary. I'll just run my regression equation across the measures that I can get for every word in the dictionary. So we did that, and uh, we did that for 31,655 words that we had lexical decision reaction times for for the English uh, language project. And uh, all of the uh, distances, emotional distances, entered reliably in as predictors. So in other words, emotionality, distance from emotionality was a strong predictor across these uh, very large words too. And it was a reliable difference. If you took out the emotion terms, the R squared went down only a little bit to 0.433. But by AIC, that was a very huge difference because we had such a massive number of words. So the AIC difference was 227, which means that the model with the emotions is millions of times better than the model without. <clears throat> One thing we noticed when we, we did this is that there were sign inconsistencies in the coefficients. So for the small set of words that we looked at, all the weights were negative, which was applied that every emotion word made you access the word faster, no matter what the emotion was. For the large set, um, Three of them had positive weights, and uh, two of them had negative weights. And there was no consistency in the ones that had positive weights. We only had one really positive emotion there, which was happiness. But um, anger and disgust also had positive rate, weights, suggesting that uh, it took longer to access words that were closely associated with anger and disgust and happiness. And that seems like a strange thing. You would think that if you were getting at some truth about how, how emotions were impinging upon lexical access, you would get exactly the same signs, at least, whenever you did it for um, a small or large set of words. Well, the explanation might be something that's been reported in the literature before, which is that reaction times to words are known to be low for two groups of words. Words that are negatively valence that have high arousal, so they're words that are associated with dangers, words that you feel bad about and strongly emotional about. And uh, 
positive words that have low arousal, words that are highly safe, that just feel good and don't um, arouse any particular strong emotions. So if you're using a model like ours to try and use emotion labels to predict uh, lexical decision reaction times, you have a problem because you have to try and titrate these two fast times and they're kind of opposite to each other. You have to say, I need weights that give me fast times for negative words when they're high arousal and fast times for positive words when they're low arousal and there's nothing in the model that is giving you arousal, so it's hard for the model to do that. Which really suggests that if you're not going to put arousal in, then uh, lexical decision reaction times aren't the best way to go about trying to predict emotionality. Which had been our original idea, we thought we would get some insight into how emotions work. But in that. So what we did is we said, let's use the five emotion word distances to directly predict the uh, emotionality judgments that we have. So instead of going round about and trying to predict the lexical decision reaction times, let's do what we did in the first study and just directly try and predict how uh, emotional people are going to judge a word. So we did that using linguistic uh, regression on um, valence, because we had these valence judgments. All the people had decided in, in that situation was whether the word was positive or negative, so it was just a binary decision, that's why we used logistic regression. And uh, we ran a regression to estimate the, uh, the valence using our emotional predictors. All of them entered in except happiness. And uh, they were very good. Here they were bin into 20 bins of about 50 stimuli each, just to show you an idea of how closely they were fit. This is the, this is the uh, um, prediction from the uh, regression equation. These are the, uh, um, the human binary ratings. And you can see that the uh, fit is quite good. So there's a, a strong fit between um, what, our, what is predicted by our model and what human beings predicted, and that's one of the reasons I put them into uh, bins here so that I can get a continuous measure from this binary measure that we started out with. Here's a slightly better picture of what's going on. You can see here how strongly our estimates for each of the emotion words correlated with the human individual estimates for each of the emotion words. Here they're bending again into 20 bins, so it's a little bit of a, uh, a trick again, but you can see they're very strongly correlated. We're getting correlations of about 0.9 between our ratings and uh, the human ratings using these bins, and you can also see something interesting, which is these go in almost ex exactly opposite directions, which explains why happiness would drop out of the re regression equation, because it's really the inverse of all of the other ones. If you take out the uh, negative emotion, if you take out, if you have the negative emotions, you can predict happiness because they're the inverse of the negative emotions. Here's a uh, qualitative demonstration of how well we did. So these are the words that were predicted to be uh, most positively valenced and most negatively valenced in order. These are Z scores, so we can tell that these are big outliers on the model. And you can see the ones that are in a bold print are the ones that were in the model on, that we developed the regression equation on. The rest of them aren't, so you can think of the ones that aren't bolded as being validation. And you can see the words uh, seem to be very well worded joy, blessings, prosperity, contentment, peace, perfection, joys, attainment, enjoyment, bliss. All of those seem to be very strongly. Uh, positive words, and if you look at the negative words, hopelessness, frustration, rage, resentment, misery, hostility, you get the idea. Very clearly, positively yeah, famous words. That's pretty good, but it is a little bit annoying that it's a totally qualitative assessment because it's very hard for us to say is that really the right ordering or not. We can agree they're all negatively famous words. So we tried to think of a way that we could go beyond qualitative assessment and find a quantitative measure that would capture this. And uh, we thought of this finding that's been put out there that claims that there's more negative than positive words, but negative uh, words are less commonly used. This argument is basically made on philosophical grounds. There's a lot of um, empirical evidence for it. The argument is, well, negative events um, are more finely differentiated because they matter more to us, so we make finer distinctions about things that are bad. But positive events, thank God, are more common than negative events, so we tend to talk about positive events and write about positive events more often than negative events. People have done only one attempt to ever assess this claim qualitatively, and it's not really totally satisfying because they used the same words, although they looked at 20 languages. So it's um, never really been uh, clearly demonstrated. But we can at least test it and see if the distribution of our words fits the um, argument, fix, fix, fix the distribution that this argument says there should be. So here's a quantile quantile uh, graph that shows it. You can see that there's many more negative words big outliers that fall off the uh, normal distribution. Then there are positive words. In fact, the uh, numbers are here. So there's 3.66% of the words 
um, that are two standard deviations high, positive, uh, sorry, negative, and there is only 0.9% of words that are on the other side of the distribution, uh, extremely positive. We can also look at the frequency of those words to get the other part of the claim, which is that the, the, frequent, the uh, negative words should be less common than the positive words. And uh, when we did that, we found the same thing. So the positive ter terms were used more often, 12 times, 12.4 times per million on average, than these negative words, which we used 5.8 times uh, per million on average. Don't forget there is uh, 31,655 words graphed here. So we're looking at thousands of words in each of those two groups. Okay, I'm out of time, and I'm also here on my second last slide. So, hopefully I've convinced you this. <coughs> emotionality plays a role in lots of time tasks in, in lexical access. It seems to be something that's probably not something we should be ignoring, because it seems to have a large effect on all kinds of measures that we take uh, and use in uh, lexical studies. One of the interesting things is that this, this small number of emotional dimensions, there's only five dimension, emotional dimensions that I looked at in the last study, they give a, they give a unique identifier, if you want to give a unique value to every word in the, in the language, at least the 31,000 that I have. So it suggests that those five dimensions might, at least in theory, be enough to start um, separating out words uh, into their individuality. And one of the things I'm starting to wonder about is if emotionality might not be secondary to lexical semantics, but actually an important part of it, exactly as William James had implied in 1878. And when we think about the meanings of words, one of the things that we're doing is experiencing the, the, the feeling that the, uh, the word gives us. Um, one of the things I'm coming to Germany to talk about is the next step. The next step is we're going to look at all those models that I mentioned. There's about uh, 11 or 12 different models of emotionality that have put forward about 30 terms. Um, now that we have these methods in hand, we can look to see which ones are the best predictors of, for example, human emotionality judgments and human behavioral measures, and see if we can find uh, which one is the best model or see if we can find an optimal subset of all of those um, emotion words. That's what I'll be doing in the next few months. Um, here's some students who work with me. These are the people I'm going to go visit in Berlin that I'm working with on this. And I thank you again for coming. It's nice to come out. Any questions? Um, Perhaps a, a couple of small questions. Yeah. Uh, first, um, have you controlled for uh, Latin versus German origin? I haven't done that. No, do you think that would make a difference? There's a big difference, I think, in, uh, in uh, English. Um, uh, words of, of, of Latin origin are experienced as more, uh, more abstract, more uh, Introduction is more abstract than forward, <laughs> yeah. and so on. Um, we, we didn't control for that, but I guess insofar as that it's, it's true, then we would have taken it into account. Well, come on, it's taken into account by the the uh, abstract concreteness judgments. Unless you're saying that factor in access, or? I, I I I believe it is it it it, it correlates, of course. Yeah. But if it is a causal. Uh, Effect or, or just a correlation? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, it, at least it may be a causal effect. Uh, if we decide, uh, there, there are data, for example, the last, I think there are some professors here in, in the auditory. There are data that that if you if, if we if we press a button to concrete words, yeah. uh, the response time to the word professor is very slow because it it, it, it appears to be a, a, an abstract word. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so the answer is we didn't do anything maybe, about that, but I, know, I have seen this kind maybe of Maybe it goes with it. Yeah, maybe it does. I, I can take a look at it. I guess I can find out where the words came from. I'm not so worried about it because in the end, we ran almost every word in the English language. So you would think that those effects would be washed over a little bit by the fact that we're reading so many words. When we have 30,000 words, it would be strange to think that we could just classify the words into their, their uh, <coughs> etymological roots. But it's possible that that is a factor, so I'll think about that. Thanks. Uh, another, uh, perhaps more, um, more serious, uh, also in relation with, with, with this uh, uh, term professor, for example, uh, that um, uh, feelings, feeling is, is, is more than emotion. Yeah. Uh, and your, your, your starting and finishing quotation from James, yeah. 
is about feelings. Right. And uh, I'm not sure that, that James meant emotions in this quotation. Uh, as as he, he spoke about such words as and, but, and so on. Yeah. Uh, feelings include, uh, each emotion involves feelings, but not vice versa. Uh, not, not, not all feelings uh, involve emotions. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I think one of the problems with the entire emotional literature, once you start looking at it, is that there is this dependence on words. Obviously, I'm the most guilty of that because we focus on the emotions that we have names for. And in fact, I'm, I'm quite certain that we put together emotions that wouldn't be differentiated because we have a name that includes all a bunch of different emotions. So there is a problem with using words, I think, to study emotions at all. And one of the pieces of evidence is the fact that you do have such disagreement between all the models about what the core emotions are. So, so I agree, there's certainly more to feelings, and I'm sure you're correct that there's more to what William James meant by feelings, because he used words that don't have strong emotional reactions, than uh, anything that I've talked about. The only, uh, I guess my only response to that is those are much harder to study because it's much harder to know what they are. And so that's, I think, why people focus on labelable emotions and, and going beyond emotions that have lexical labels, that have names for them, is going to be difficult because how do you know when you have it? How do you know what it is? Uh, yes, I agree. I agree that uh, it's much, much easier to, to study emotions than non-emotional feelings uh, because there are, because there are many models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are, yeah. I mean, do you have any idea how you would get it, these, these non-labeled? You know, I guess the only thing I would say is, don't forget, we looked at, in the end here, 30,000 words using, I admit, emotion labels, but we looked at, our measure was how closely they related on all five of those emotions and how well all five of those emotions together predicted whether people said they were positive or negatively valence. So we're getting a subtle mixture of multiple emotional levels, right? This is mixing together all of those five emotions, all five of them, all four of the five, were in the regression equation. So we're getting, in a way, we're, we're making a more fine-grained distinction than it looks. We're not splitting up our words into just four emotions, the four words that enter into the, uh, the regression equation. We're splitting them up into um, a continuum that is based on a linear combination of those four emotions. And I agree, those four emotions are probably arbitrary, and we work with them because those are the ones we have labels for. But we do know, we've, we have started the work that I talked about at the end, and it does seem like it doesn't make that much difference which emotional levels, labels you choose. And one of the reasons that's not surprising is emotional labels themselves are very closely similar on uh, co-occurrence models to other emotional um, labels. So I, I put up disgust at the beginning, and if you noticed, if I had more time, I would emphasize the fact that the, among the uh, label, the close neighbors of disgust, which I use as an example, where I think sadness and anger. So two of the other three emotions uh, uh, the other four emotions that I talked about. So there's a subtlety. So I think there's something here a little bit more subtle than just classifying things into five emotions. But whether it's the best way to get at those more subtle feelings, I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have sort of a related question, I guess, which is, I'm wondering if you think some of these effects are lexical or if they're cultural, because I'm wondering if you've done this study in a culture where they actually pay attention to emotions a little bit more than they do in North America. Um, and I think that you could actually like find some really interesting effects there, right? Because like, you know, maybe they do differentiate sadness from disgust more <coughs> than you know, people. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, agree. I mean, there may be, it may be that there is a more fine-grained distinction, even using these techniques and even within people where we yeah. We're going to find out that, that another combination of, late, of emotion terms gives us better predictions of whatever it is we want to predict, whether it's <laughs> the emotion ratings, some kind of behavioral effect of those emotional ratings, which might start getting at, um, I mean, it sort of is related to his question, right? It might start getting at a more nuanced view of what emotion is. But I, again, I, I give him the same answer, I give you the same answer that I gave just now. I think this is a, a more nuanced view than it looks like because of the fact that we're actually taking a linear combination of a whole bunch of different emotions and saying that's what we're going to use to classify each word. It's not just saying this word is related to anger or this word is related to disgust. We're saying this word is 31.6% related to anger and 22% related to disgust or whatever the linear progression model says.
Yeah. Do you think that that corresponds to how people mean feel these things? I don't know. You know, I, 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 I have been thinking about this. I, I do think that uh, motion labels are obviously a very gross way to get at what's going on inside the, uh, yeah. the human mind. On the other hand, uh, over the, the many centuries that we've been talking, we've evolved on a fairly small number of emotion labels, and presumably if we needed a much larger set to be able to discuss things that really matter to us, we would have a much, much larger set. So I think there is, of course people can talk about their emotions in much more nuanced ways using more complicated language, but the fact that we have settled on, in the end, really only about 30 emotional terms that cover every model that's out there who, who claim to be getting at the basic emotions, Makes me wonder if there's a, as much, if, if there's agreement anyway on, on how to name and talk about the other things. And if we can't talk about them, then how? And then we're in the big and shiny and state of, oh, and if your red is the same as my red, right? How, if we don't know, if we don't have a word for emotion, then how do I know you're in that state? How do I, I mean, even if we have a word, how can I figure out whether it's the same state if it's a very subtle, strange run about things? But of course, you know, that said, there are other emotion terms, like, uh, what's the famous German one for? The emotion of being satisfied in someone else's failure? Yeah. Schadenfreude. Schadenfreude. Yeah. <laughs> we, we don't have that in English, and that's a, a very easy recognizable state that uh, once you're in it, you, you really should be named. So we've, of course, taken that word in and taken Schadenfreude. Yeah. So you basically, one of the findings here is that the more negative things are, the faster you are responding. It's not actually that simple because uh, people respond quickly to both negative mm -hmm. words and some kinds of positive words. But in general, yes, the more so negative it is, the slower it is, and the more, you know. So right. if you had two groups of people that were reliably, one group was reliably much more positive and happy than the other, would you expect the moment which had slower reaction times? Um, yes. I mean, I think well, we, we kind of felt that with manipulating the emotionality. I guess, you know, the, the ultimate manipulation of emotionality is take people who are very responsive to negative emotions and be very depressive people and people who are not and they're very happy people. And yeah, I would predict, I'm willing to predict that the happy people are going to respond faster than the depressed people. Of course, depressed people are more slow at everything, so it's not that mm -hmm. much of a limb to go. The, the entire next proposition that you think the literature on aging would actually support you. You would? All the people are much happier and they're much slower than you. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Maybe that's fine. Maybe we should look at something. It's not, it's not that they're getting old and decrepit, but just that they're more cheerful. I would actually expect that you'll get a better correlate. You look at the young ELP reaction times, you're going to get a better correlation with the old ones. Interesting. We should look at that. It's easy to do. I'll check that out. Thanks. Yeah. So, the people you showed, some of you know, they talk. They were basically negative words were uh, they were more abstract and positive words more specific, right? Um, there was there was a beautiful table some of that. Well thank you for saying it was a beautiful table. Which one was it? Uh, no, no, no. We're, we're probably are you talking about the graph where I showed the No, it was a table it was top twenty negative words and top oh, okay. thirty. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think that was a little better, yeah. Mm. You're thinking of the um the joy discussed list. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 yeah. So it's I'm just yeah, that's that's, that's yeah, the one, yeah. So it's it's really curious because if you take say uh, basic ECMO emotions and I really I don't really like ECMO, but um if you look at the six basic categories, there are four of them are negative. There's one that's kind of ambivalent, surprise, and then there's one happy emotion. Right, yeah. And the explanation behind that that's often given is that we tend to categorize our experience, life experience, more in a more fine-grained way when right. we come to negative experience. Exactly. And here it seems to be the opposite, that um, negative words are kind of more abstract, right? That's the concreteness. That is the claim, yeah. We're not the first people to make that claim. Look, people yeah. have said that abstract words tend to be more negatively valence in general. Yeah. So how do you explain that? Well, uh, yeah, it is a good question. I, I'm not sure why it is that so many, uh, I guess the question is why are so many abstract words negatively valence? And I, I don't know the answer except that maybe it's because we do want to make fine-grained distinctions in the world on, on negative things and so we put a lot more effort into coming up with words that make Find a distinction about the negative things. So it could be, in other words, related to the thing that I showed you at the end, that fact that that tail of negatively valence words is much bigger and began and be claimed by the people who have, have first said that is that the reason that happens is what you just said, because 
we make more fine-grained distinctions. So maybe these negative words are coming out as a, in more fine-grained distinctions because of that thing. But don't forget, one of the things that I said is that there are a lot of negative words that fall on the positive side. I mean, a lot of abstract words that fall on the positive side that people have tended to ignore. They've always said, and it, it is true as a general rule that negative words are, are I mean, that abstract words are negative events. But if you look at words like soul and beauty, they surely are, to me, abstract words, right? And yet, they're positive events, and, and I think, when I said, that's one of the nice things about doing this measure is it puts them up, which is exactly where people put them, which seems to suggest that people are not just going on whether the word is abstract or not, they're doing something else when you ask them to judge that. So um, the other, I guess, potential answer, given the extreme, the fact that these words are highly religious, the other answer might be that negative emotions are much more salient, we feel them much more strongly, so we have more words for them, and we have uh, more ways of talking about them. Happiness is sort of abstract and vague and almost almost nothing, whereas all of the negative emotions are something. Got a question about um, feeling and preferences on two ends. Um, one, I'll just talk about feeling and emotion and, and the um, neurological activity. It makes me wonder uh, if you have any thoughts on hormones and uh, arousal of certain hormones when uh, we read a word or hear a word. Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything to say about that. That would be meaningful. Okay, okay. <laughs> it seems like a, an interesting direction. Yeah, it does. I agree. To go with it, yeah, to yeah. Maybe, I don't know, testosterone or... or um... Estrogen? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> no, I mean, that, um, do we have like this, this risk aversion um, and this disgust emotion, um, stress hormones as well? Seem interesting. Um, my other thought connected to this is: uh, Do you have any thoughts on economic models, and that you have preferences for certain uh, certain emotions because they lead to, to actions that are better for? Better for the agent's utility, something like that. I'm not sure. So, are you, are you saying are you asking an evolutionary question, or are you asking the, the social manipulation question? Are you saying, no, either <laughs> way. I, I'm sure both. So, oh, well, I, 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 don't, I don't have much to say. I haven't really thought about that. But um, well, you could think that if you're dealing with a whole scale out of negative emotions, mm -hmm. you don't want to. You know, negative emotions can be threatening uh, to to the people around you and by developing a precise vocabulary to take one from the other, like anger from disgust. You, know, you don't want to see you don't want to respond to those in the same way. Uh, whereas with, with happiness it might be. So I, I see some direction in which that might go. I mean I yeah, I don't know really where the question's coming from, but one another thing that you can think about is when people do socially manipulate each other, uh, like their citizens, for example, it's often on the basis of disgust. So the enemy is often made out to be subhuman and so horrific that they are like worms or insects or something like that, and, and you reduce the feeling of disgust. So you think the way the Americans talked about the Vietnamese during the war, it, it was appalling, right? And it, uh, that's happened in every war all around the world where people have identified their enemies with something disgusting and hard, and you can see that why it would be easier to kill them if you think about it. That's, that's one place. Yeah? Yeah. I recall that at the beginning of the talk you had a nice definition about concreteness that uh, the referent is something that we can kind of sense. sense yeah. And I wonder always uh, about that. Uh, did you try to count the number of senses that, for example, there is a difference? Like, yeah. I could not taste the dog, but I can taste the orange. So, the number of well, senses I that taste I have. the dog, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I see sun, sun is concrete, for example, yeah. but you yeah. can I only agree. see that, and then an orange you can. That's a good question. Uh, I personally have that, but I believe that other people have done it, but I'm not sure what they found. Does anyone know? <laughs> I think people have done exactly that kind of thing where they kind of say that some words are more concrete. Yeah, exactly I, the reason I'm that you say it because there's way more ways to access them. And some are surely more concrete just because they can be accessed. For example, you know, Mars, well, no Mars, we can see all the time, but say Jupiter. And Jupiter is surely concrete, and yet we have absolutely no yeah, interaction yeah. with it whatsoever. So we have to mark it as concrete, but there's something where we have no sensory access to it. Our concreteness is purely an abstract thing. So it uh, would be interesting to look at that. I, I do think someone's done that. I wonder if that matters also when the people rate this uh, 
in seven to one scales. The number of sentences. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah it's a good idea. I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that it is so uh, um, easy because um, f formally it is more or less clear what is concrete and what is abstra abstract. But oh, you think so? And then what yes, really yes, but, it, right? but 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 I'm not, I'm not sure that this this sensory experience is uh, really um, a, a, a decisive a decisive factor. Uh, for example. Beauty is, of course, is, it is formally uh, an abstract word, yeah. but uh, I, I, I see so many beautiful objects around me I that I can say that beauty as such becomes, to some extent, concrete. I agree. Uh, and that, that, is, I mean, that is what people do, right? That was the point yes. of these words with arrows beside them. When people have a strong feeling about something that really is abstract, like the yes. spirit of beauty, they rate it as concrete, which shows that they are not following the instructions, right? They're, by the way, they're not. Yeah, exactly. They're that's, not, that's my point. <laughs> yeah, they're not huge. Well, that's my point. That's why we shouldn't use <laughs> judgments, right? Because I, I think what people are doing is saying, if I have a strong sensation of this word, that I'm going to rate it as concrete, and it doesn't matter where that sensation comes from. Mm -hmm. if, if it comes from, my experience of beauty, and then I go, good enough. That's a concrete thing, because I, mm -hmm. it's tangible to me. And I, that's, uh, that's the point I was trying to make by pointing out these words, which are largely words that are tangible, like loveliness and beauty, and even the soul for some people, not so much for me, is a tangible thing. And so I think that, yeah, it's, it's not as clear as it should be um, to people what we mean when we say, can you touch it? Because people have other ways of experiencing things and making them tangible. Yeah. <coughs> I would like to go back to some of your very first slides where you were showing those you know, prefrontal areas that mm -hmm. are involved in motion processing. And <coughs> now, um, one of the theories that we have been playing with is that if you go from a uh, a lot of things like frequency effects might be in your uh, <coughs> striatal. And, and then prefrontal processes will kick in later. Uh, I think when you mean so prefrontal, you're like the most here, here's, 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 can I, can I, yeah, yeah. The most reliable task that activates all the frontal cortex, right, is when you have a multiple tra um, tracking task. So if I make you give a visual search task where you have to track three objects moving around the screen, lights up over the orbital frontal cortex. So actually, it's going to be very silly to have this question. So my question is, is this. I don't know whether anybody has looked at the eye tracking data for these kind of emotion words. Uh, because there's two possible outcomes. You could see that you don't get any effects of emotion in, say, the very first fixation durations. Suppose you land on the word, you spend 140 milliseconds there, blind your next cicade, and off you go to the next word. Yeah? Now, it could be that you don't see any of your emotion valence uh, uh, stuff predicting that. And then, you know, if you look at the total gaze duration, you might suddenly see all these effects kicking. So that's scenario one. And there's another scenario, uh, which is prompted a little bit by some auditory stuff that we did, where we can see that you get effects of danger and usefulness in different kind of way of looking at emotion. And you get, for and get very early yeah. effects. Yeah. And that would link up to the Deuce theory of the subcortical pathway, which would be, you know, if something is dangerous, then you want to be really able to get there quickly. So in that case, and as such, you might find that you already get these danger and or, or these emotional effects, say within 140 milliseconds of looking time, it's a word. Uh, you know, anybody haven't tried to sort those no, things out? I, I don't know. I mean, the only work that I know is the work that you told me about that you did, the danger words, which makes me think that they're going to find very early effects. But then it makes you ask the question, why if you find these really early effects of emotionality, does it slow people down? I guess the answer might be they get a negative emotion and then they get a little scared or something. They draw back and then I don't want to do this. Something like that. You think? Yeah, I, I, but I don't know. The evolutionary the theory behind the loose theory is that, you know, that if you see a tiger, uh, <laughs> you want to run as quickly as possible. You don't want to own the tiger and because if you do that, then you're eating. And so it's, uh, it's, it's good to be able to respond very quickly 
to stimulate uh, the environment that are dangerous mm -hmm. uh, or that have um, potentially high uh, substantial consequences for your survival. But you know whether that would develop in reading, for instance. I will, I will tell you much of my disappointment that the Dwight discuss is a very bad predictor of uh, danger versus usefulness ratings. I did like yeah. that because I was thinking maybe this was it. Yes, yeah. it's, it's, it's not a very good predictor at all of uh, dangerousness or usefulness ratings. Yeah. So. Harold didn't get where I thought he was going to go. But, <laughs> so I agree with you. Well, but, but, but that, that activity in the um, OFC just could be the fact that you've got tighter neighborhoods, right? When you're doing that sort of decision, what? if you've got your tighter lexical neighborhoods for yeah, your yeah, could be, I agree. Right, then you, if you predict you've got more track, you know, competing objects to track in rapid rate, like so, make the decision, then you'd expect the OFC activation. Oh, I see what you're saying. Because there's more negative words, when you realize it's a negative word, it takes longer. To be you've got to, you're activating a denser neighborhood. Right? Yeah, maybe, so yeah. if you imagine you're instantiating some sort of neighborhood that you've got to then actually, all right, this is the good index. Yeah, it's it's denser, to... but smaller. So it's more tightly coupled here. Yeah, there's more tightly coupled. Yeah. yeah, there's more tightly coupled. So I guess we can say it's a harder differentiation. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting idea. Okay, I think uh, people should leave now. <laughs>